used to be with you this morning because I want to take you to several passages of Scripture. There's going to be a commonality between the passages of Scripture that I'm choosing. All of these passages are written by John. I don't want to say that I have favorites from out of the Word of God, but some writers of the Word of God I tend to enjoy more than others. When's the last time that any of you got blessed by reading a passage out of the book of Obadiah? How many of you are big fans of Nahum? When's the last time you read the book of Jude? I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. But again, John is one of those that oftentimes we will turn to because there is so much in it. And of course we know when we read the Gospel of John, and again I want to say this, I believe about all of the Word of God, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So maybe I'm wrong in telling you that I like some writers better than others. The Holy Spirit is the one that's prompting these men to write down these passages of Scripture. But I really appreciate John because John did, did an awful lot of writing. John wrote not only the Gospel of John, he wrote what else? First, second, third John, and the book of Revelation. So we owe a lot to him having written down what he did. Um, again, by profession, John's trade was what? Remember he had brother James and John they were called what? The sons of Zebedee and they had a nickname. Thunder. Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder, that's what it means and the actual name was Bo Energies. Uh, that you may end up saying why were they called Sons of Thunder? Would anybody like to speculate why they were called Sons of Thunder? Loud. Loud? Loud. 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 You get a little bit of feel because in, in one of the Gospels it talks about that Jesus, when he was going through an area, sent the disciples ahead to see if he could um, find a place to lodge there. And the disciples had gone basically into a Samaritan village. And really the Samaritans should have felt honored that a Jew would actually come into their midst because the Samaritans were treated as outcasts. But the people in that village said, no, no room in the inn. It's one of the first time Jesus heard those words. And those disciples, they came back to Jesus, and it says in Scripture that they were indignant. What does indignant mean? Insulted. Most people, they didn't want anything to do to you. And so James and John proposed what? That Jesus do what to, to get back at these people? Let's call down fire from heaven and burn them up. <laughs> And Jesus says, what? You guys don't even understand what, what type of a person you're supposed to be. You know, we're not here to, to bring a lot of judgment. We're here to bring people to salvation. I mean, it's, and so I'm just giving you kind of this background of John um, so that we understand this person. He's also referred to as the beloved disciple. We believe that he's the one that wrote the Gospel of John, that he was the one ones that was closest to Jesus. We oftentimes hear Jesus associated with Peter, James, and John. And of course, uh, James, the brother of John, got executed. Remember that Herod had him executed, and the next day he was going to execute Peter, and that's when the angel came and rescued Peter from prison. Peter ends up outside of a house, and a servant girl is there named Rhoda, and she goes in and tells the people inside that were praying for Peter's release, hey, good news, he's here. And they were like, you're out of your mind. They went out there and sure enough, he was, he was escaped in the Spirit of God. So I'm just trying to give you some, some thoughts. I don't know if you ever put the pieces together, but when, when I get a hold of passages of Scripture, I like to know something about the person that wrote this down. And John was somebody that was thoroughly acquainted with Jesus. You know, John was one of the ones that went with Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus only took three people up there. Peter, James, and John. You know? And uh, 
So John was somebody that spent an awful lot of time with Jesus. What I want to talk with you this morning that John has recorded for us is something that has been of concern to me in, in recent months, is that we, and especially in recent weeks, that we really understand who Jesus is. And y'all say, well, I know that he's the Son of God. I only say that because within our Sunday school classes, we've dealt with this recently, and it's not just in our Sunday school classes. I've dealt with it on Sunday nights as well. There's a lot of misunderstandings out there about Jesus. Lots of people believe in Jesus. Did you know that Muslims believe in Jesus? But what do they believe about Jesus? And y'all say, does it really matter? You bet you, little beaver. It matters an awful lot. Because just because you believe in somebody, if it is not the right belief, it's not good enough. What do the Muslims believe about Jesus? I've told you folks before. Do you remember what I told you? That he's a prophet. He's a prophet. Like? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Or even? Yeah. They would even say the one that I talked to said that he was kind of like Moses. And the reason he, he, he used the illustration of Moses, he said, because Moses was able to part the Red Sea. Pretty impressive stuff. <coughs> Moses was able to do some other things, you know, miracle-wise. And so they just group him as, you know, he's just like Moses. Is that what the Bible tells us about Jesus? No. No, Jesus is so much more than a Moses. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus ended up asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some of them say that you're um, Elijah. Some say maybe Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ. You are the one that God has appointed for our salvation. And I'm making such a big issue of this because I've seen Christians end up being sucked into other religions and they are abandoning a foundation of our faith that if you do not see the importance of Jesus without looking at what the Bible says about Jesus, Jesus is God. So if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting the God of the Bible. I know some people say, well, he's not God the Father. Now, I understand. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's one of the reasons why the Jews won't accept Jesus as being God. They say, no, there's just God. They don't recognize the Holy Spirit. They do not recognize Jesus. And Jesus basically said to the Jews during his day, look, you people... Believe in God, you say that you, but you reject me. And without me, you can't be saved. You're going to die in your sins. And so I just want to emphasize that you and I really do need to look at what the Bible says. I don't want to spend too much time here in kind of these introductory comments. But there's lots of religions out there that will use the name of Jesus. I don't care if you're talking about the Jews, I don't care if you're talking about the Muslims. The Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, what do they believe about Jesus? Do they believe that He's God? No, they don't. They reject Him. They do the same thing to Jesus that the Jews do. They do the same thing to Jesus that the Muslims do. They do the same thing to Jesus that Jehovah's Witnesses do. They reject the divinity of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, why is it important that I recognize the divinity of Jesus Christ because recognizing the divinity of Jesus Christ acknowledges who you worship. If somebody is not divine, you don't worship them. If they are, they are worthy of our worship. Look through our songbook. Some people look at me and say, well, I just think that we should be lifting up God. Nothing is God. Nothing against God, but the songs in our songbook are about who? I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises. 
Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. The songs in our book emphasize the importance of understanding the significance of Jesus. I've done enough on the introduction, I hope. I want you to look with me this morning at, at passages of Scripture that John ended up writing. I think I've got about ten passages of Scripture. doesn't mean that we're going to go through all of these. But I want you to start by looking in 2 John. That's back near the book of Revelation. These are in no particular order. I just kind of scribbled these down. And by the way, these aren't all the passages of Scripture. There are so many other passages of Scripture. But look with me in 2 John chapter what? Twenty-seven. <laughs> well, there's only one chapter of 2 John. There's only one chapter in 2 John, okay? Verse 9, look at what he says. This is what John says. 2 John, verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ, what? Does not have God. So in other words, if you start abandoning Jesus Christ, John is saying very clearly, you don't follow the teachings of Jesus Christ because there's others out there to come along and they're going to understand, as I said before, with the Muslims. They will end up coming and talk about Muhammad. They will follow Muhammad more than they will follow Jesus. And John would say, listen, if you're not following the teachings of Jesus, you don't have God. You do use the Mormons, Joseph Smith. Brigham Young, they're responsible for establishing the Mormon faith. They start leaving out Jesus. What would John say? You abandon the teachings of Jesus. You don't have God. I'm afraid that many times within our pews, we've lost sight of this because we end up thinking, well, it's okay. It really doesn't matter what I believe. And I'm going to tell you this morning, as you go through the Word of God, it matters an awful lot. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. You might find this a little bit scary to read, but look at the next verse. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Were you aware that that was in the Word of God? Turn with me back to 1 John. Chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And this is for people that say that they know Jesus Christ, and yet they continue to live a life of sin. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. The man who says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands, what? Is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys His Word, God's love is truly made complete in Him. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him 
must walk as Jesus did. Read it for yourself. Look with me down at the 23rd verse. 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. In other words, if you reject Jesus, you've rejected God. You can't have one without the other. Let's continue. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason is, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. People that want to talk about what God is like, if you leave out Jesus Christ, you don't completely understand who God is. If you don't look at Jesus, I'll, I'll eventually get to this. But over in John chapter 14, when Jesus is speaking with Philip, he says, Philip says, hey, Jesus, do us a favor. Show us the Father and that will suffice. In other words, that'll be good enough if you show us the Father. And Jesus just exasperated almost, says, my goodness. You mean to tell me that I've been with you such a long time? And you don't understand? <clears throat> That if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. <laughs> so I said I was going to get to that one later on, but it won't hurt to throw it in there now. Look down in 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Again, let me just throw this in. Why do we create laws? Protect us. Protect us. To keep us safe. What do you see going on here within America these days? Lawlessness. Let's just destroy everything. You don't understand that these laws are actually given... For our good. Okay? And I'm speaking about defunding the police and all the other stuff that's going on out there. Foolishness. So, sin is lawlessness. Verse 5. But, but you know that He, speaking of Jesus, He appeared so that He might take away our sins. And in Him is no sin. No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. Pretty strong stuff. Not only have you not seen Him, you don't know Him. Again, look down at verses 7 through 10. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God 
will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know, not how we think. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is what? What was that again? Not a child. Is not a child of God. Nor is anyone who does not love his brother. We've got some other passages of scripture I want to take you to. I want you to go with me back to the gospel of John. I'm going to start back in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 19. Then they asked him, Okay, and there's Pharisees, if you look up the 13th verse. He's speaking not only to people, but he's also speaking to Pharisees. They asked him, where is your father? And Jesus said to these religious men, Pharisees, what were Pharisees? Pharisees were the guys there at the, there at the temple. They were kind of like the, the religious leaders. What did Jesus say to them? He says, you do not know me or my father. You guys that claim that you know God, you don't even know God. Because without knowing Jesus, you can't really know who God is. These are guys that have devoted their entire life to be in church. And Jesus ends up saying, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. I mean, look with me down in the 23rd verse. I hadn't included it, but just look at the 23rd verse. He continued. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you what? That you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be you will indeed die in your sins. Am I starting to, to get across this is central to our understanding that Jesus is the Savior that takes away the sin of the world. It is not enough just to say, well, I think that Jesus is a good guy. No. Jesus is our everything, folks. Look at me another passage of Scripture. Um, John chapter, let's go to John chapter 14. I've already quoted this to you. John chapter 14. I'm going to start at the sixth verse. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. And that will be enough for us. In other words, that will suffice. That's what he used to say in the King James Version. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? 
The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Look with me at another passage of Scripture. John chapter 15, verse 21. Again, Jesus is talking about the way that we're going to be persecuted. He says in the 21st verse, and then he said that we are going to get persecuted. They will treat you this way, verse 21, because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. They claim to be godly people, but they don't know the God that they're serving. They don't know God. You and I come to know God through Jesus Christ. Look at me, chapter 15, um, take that back, chapter 16, verse 3. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Look over chapter 17, verse 25. This is a prayer that Jesus offered not only for His disciples, but a prayer that Jesus offered for us as well. Because if you go back and read it, He says, Lord, I'm praying not only for these, but I'm praying for all of those that will come to know You because of their witness. Okay? Um, if you want to have that backed up, uh, let me find it for you. Look at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you're in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now going down to that 25th verse. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I'm going to close with one other passage of Scripture. I mean, I hope that you're seeing the importance of of hanging on to Jesus Christ and understanding who Jesus Christ is. I'm not just like picking out one verse. I mean, Scripture is full of the importance of Jesus Christ. This last passage of Scripture happens to be one of my favorite passages of Scripture from Colossians chapter 1. And this passage is not written by John the Apostle. This is written by Paul, the Apostle Paul. Who did the Apostle Paul say that Jesus Christ is? Chapter 1, beginning verse 15. Hey, Paul. Who's Jesus? Paul responds by saying, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. Pay attention to this. Verse 19, For God was pleased 
to have all His fullness dwell in Him. The completeness of God Almighty the Father dwells in the person of Jesus Christ. And through Him, through Jesus, not through Muhammad, not through Joseph Smith, not through anybody else, through Him to reconcile to Himself all things. God wants to reconcile the things that have been alienated because of sin. God wants to reconcile them, bring them back into alignment with Him. To reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. How is He going to do that? By making peace through the blood of Jesus through His blood shed on the cross. And folks, this is just kind of like a crash course. There are so many other passages of Scripture that talk about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. I preach it from a burdened heart because it's not the first time it happened. They struggled with the same thing back in those days. People did not understand how important it is to understand Jesus Christ and who He is. Without Jesus Christ, folks, we don't have anything. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, our devotion ne never needs to waver from this unflinching belief that without Jesus, we are lost forever. Don't come around me trying to put down Jesus Christ. According to the Bible, folks, you and I cannot elevate Jesus Christ too much. And when I say that, some people say, you mean even higher than God? What does God end up saying? It's going to happen at the end of time. What does Apostle Paul say in Philippians chapter 2? That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess of things on earth, above the earth, under the earth, everything will confess to the glory of God the Father that what? Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of y'all say, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not in danger. I'm not in danger of losing my faith in Jesus Christ. Folks, we are bombarded by messages all the time that want to put down the fact that we are unabashed followers of Jesus Christ. You know who it was that died for my sins so that I could go to heaven? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. That's why when we sing songs like the old rugged cross, that last verse, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It shame and reproach gladly bear. And he'll bear me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So, I'll cherish the old rugged cross. I pray that within our churches we might understand we are Christians. We are followers of Jesus Christ. There has never been a name that is higher than the name of Jesus Christ. And you and I are proud followers of Jesus Christ. I don't know for anybody that's out there watching on the internet how you expect to go to heaven. I think down deep everybody wants to believe that everybody just automatically goes to heaven. But there again, folks, Jesus came to tell us, no, everybody's not going to go to heaven. Who is it that's going to go to heaven? 
Jesus says, the person that believes in me. I've oftentimes quoted, and I'm going to close the service today by quoting it again. John 3.16, where Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. He says, Hey, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Nicodemus, I want you to understand. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And then Jesus closed with these words, and He says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Folks, it does matter what you believe. Jesus has told us that it matters. And I hope and pray that you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, will hold on to those beliefs because it is that belief that brings about our salvation. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for the reminder this morning as we've had a chance to look at what your word teaches about the importance of of our belief in your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you might help us never to waver in our commitment to Him, that we might stay steadfast in our insistence that Jesus is not a way, Jesus is the way. Not that Jesus is a truth, but that Jesus is the truth. Not that Jesus is a life, but Jesus is the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one will ever come to the Father except through Him. Help us to believe those words because that is what your Son has taught us. We pray that we might be even more devoted to your Son, Jesus Christ, because we recognize He is the Christ. Not a Christ. He is the Christ. And when Peter said that in Matthew chapter, sec, chapter 16, Jesus said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood. This is a spiritual truth that transforms lives. And Jesus says, And on this truth, that is what I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Help us to stay steadfast that you are the Christ, the one that God has anointed and appointed to bring salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us. Help us to live for you. If there's anybody that needs to give their hearts to you, I pray, Father, that they might simply say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart. I give my life to you. Father, may they receive the salvation that you have promised to all those that will place their faith and trust in your Son. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pay attention to the words on page 657.